What is up, Metsed Up listeners? Back here for episode number 37 of the Metsed Up podcast, the Casey Stengel episode. Of course, famous number 37, New York Mets. Yeah, not a lot great going on here in Mets land. You would have mm-hmm. thought after the trade deadline and facing the Reds and just how this Mets team has been playing, there was a lot to look forward to here. Back in black, the jerseys, everything Carrasco making his debut. You would think that there was a lot to be excited about in New York Mets land, but this weekend was terrible this weekend was awful i couldn't have thought of a worse way to welcome in javi baez to the tri-state area to queens to flushing we had a miserable miserable weekend so me and james of course are going to talk about the games during the series the trade deadline as well as the kamar rocker news because well we have some kamar rocker news and it's not great you've probably heard it already so we'll give our two thoughts on that of course james co-host james shiano jeter had no range me giraffe neck mark at giraffe neck mark Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Metsed Up, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you want to find us. That's where you can listen to us and check out the YouTube channel as well, Metsed Up Podcast. You can find the video form of what we're doing right now. James, it's a dreary day, I feel like, in Metsland. We brought back the black jerseys and it's almost symbolized some some negative <laughs> feelings here. A little death almost. Uh, yeah, it's Nigerian pole bears. That's what we are right now. But this is one of the worst weeks of the entire Met season. This was a Wilpon week. This was a huge, huge Wilpon week. I don't feel like that's a term we've seen on Twitter, but it should come out because this was mm-hmm. a huge, huge Wilpon week. I mean, it got started with the trade deadline basically this weekend. Yes. That was the big thing Friday. The Mets were expected to be aggressive buyers, pitching, mm-hmm. hitting, bullpen, whatever it was. We got Rich Hill before the deadline. Mm-hmm. And on the deadline day, we thought that maybe we'd be in play for Jose Barrios, maybe mm-hmm. in play for a Kyle Hendricks, Zach Davies, some of the pitchers on the market. We ended up coming home with Javi Baez and Trevor Williams for Pete Crow Armstrong. Yeah. I I mean, you were here. If you mm-hmm. were watching the live stream on my YouTube channel, you would have saw our reactions in live. We were happy about getting Javi Baez. Two-part reaction. Yeah, two-part reaction. Happy about getting Javi Baez. Feeling great. We're like, nice. That's a good player. And then we saw for PCA. And it was like, oh, ah, yeah. yikes. So... Little hypocritical of me. I always say I will trade for bona fide stars. I'll trade prospects for bona fide stars. I've said it. I can't really back down from that. And I do think that PCA isn't the caliber of prospect where we're talking about like a Kellenic in the past. And I know people have PTSD mm-hmm. with that. He's not that kind of player just yet. No. But this trade was uh it was different as the day went on for sure. Yeah, I think that um I'll try to find my words here. I think it's hard to call Javi Baez a bona fide star right now. I think he has been a bona fide star, and he has bona fide star potential, and he brings an it factor that not many other players in baseball bring. But you can't really call his concrete production that of a bona fide star. The guy's WRC plus is barely above 100. He strikes out in like he's in the like third percentile in the league in strikeout rate, whiff rate. He does things on the field that make you go wow and make you think he can be one of the best players. But when you like look at the whole fruit together, it's not what he is seen to be, I feel like, by the mass media and by the more casual baseball fan. That being said, I still think the trade was a positive one. The Mets got better by acquiring Javi Baez and Trevor Williams. But I think that there's a really wide range of reactions from Mets fans. And I think really what we all have to be is somewhere in the middle and understand what this guy is and what he actually can be moving forward yeah and i feel like on the live stream it was the best way to explain it because we were we were happy we were like nice that's a that's a solid pickup we finally see Mm -hmm. a name because up until what the last 30 40 minutes the mets had done nothing it was crickets yes and we were happy for javi but then we saw pca and pca is a guy that you know we've both been high on we both like Mm -hmm. pca he of Mm -hmm. course is out for the year with a shoulder injury which is yes probably Honestly, the big reason why they moved him, I think. It's a torn labrum, but it's not his throwing arm. So that's I, something... What? I Go. just feel like because he's going to miss this year, his year of growth and his year of like minor league growth is now pushed back until next season. And it feels yeah. like the Mets, under Steve Cohen, have this three- to five-year plan to be a team that's going to win now. Mm-hmm. And PCA just doesn't fit into that plan right now, especially with essentially missing a year of you know growth. 100%. That's super similar logic to why I was saying throughout the last few episodes of this podcast to trade Ronnie Mauricio, that he didn't fit that three to five year window. We never considered Pete Crow Armstrong as a trade candidate just because of his injury and his recent status as a first round pick. But I think the Mets were aware that if he was ever going to get to the major leagues, it wasn't going to be for at least four seasons. So 
It's kind of like, what have you done for me lately? It's also interesting to note that the Mets have just made the complete habit of trading their first round picks. We only now have two first round picks with the organization since 2016. And we don't even have the one that we just got in this last draft. Well, no, it's about to go through. We traded Anthony K. We traded Justin Dunn. We traded Jared Kalanick, everybody knows. PCA's gone. We did not sign Kamar Rocker. As a spoiler, it's all the Mets fans living under a rock. David Peterson and Brett Bader, the only first-round picks over the last six drafts who remain with the Mets. Also, like, crazy the names that the Mets have taken in the first round with Justin Dunn, Anthony K. Yes. We've taken some, like, real swings and misses with guys in the first yeah. round recently. They are all major league players, though, so it's a swing and a miss in the sense that these didn't these guys didn't become like very good players, but they all got there, which is still a large accomplishment for a first round pick. That's never a given. Yes, no, of course. Like getting to the major leagues is typically the kind of definition of like if you're a successful draft pick or not. But in this trade, the Mets also got money from the Cubs, which is super interesting, and that's probably yes. why PCA also is going over in that deal. Not that the Mets seem to care about the tax line, but it always is nice to be below it if you can, because you don't want to have to pay those penalties if you don't have to. No, but yeah, I did some math about this trade, and the Mets were $8 million below the tax line at the time of the trade. That was after the acquisition of Rich Hill. Because the Rays, they don't pay anybody. That's not They're, not, they're never going to do that. If the Mets would have taken the rest of Javi Baez's pro-rated contract, about $5 million, they would not have exceeded the tax line. Even when you add Trevor Williams, about $1.2, $1.1 million left for the season, they still would have been slightly below it. And without the player movement allowed for the next couple months of the season, it really wouldn't have been an issue to get above or below the tax line. A lot of people are taking shots at the Mets management, Steve Cohen, for not taking out money and giving up PCA for like the sake of cost saving. But if you look at every trade the Cubs made, they kept the money in every deal to maximize their prospect return. So it seems like the Cubs were only negotiating with teams when everyone was aware that the Cubs were paying 100% of contracts that was going to be factored into the cost. You know, if this was the only trade where the Cubs took on the money, I would have said, yeah, this is weird. I don't know why Steve Cohen, the Mets manager, are acting like this. But this was a very consistent thing. So I can't really hold it against the Mets for giving up the prospect capital in exchange for the money because I don't think that's really true. Yeah, and like to go off PCA's prospect status too here, we talked about his injury. It's not a sure thing either with him, like no it is way. with any prospect. It's it's never sure. It's almost never a sure thing. It is so hard to get a guy who's a guaranteed stud. PCA, a lot of people weren't sold on as bad. As an athlete, as a center fielder, he will be able to play center field at a major league level. I don't think anyone yeah. has doubts on that. Mm -hmm. But the big thing with Pico Armstrong was always going to be his bat. Now, there are some scouts that have been high and said, wow, his bats really improved since he's been drafted over that time period between the draft and when he was making his debut in the minors. But there's still a lot of people who aren't sold on his game. So, yes, Mets fans, we have the PTSD. We know what we've given up in the past and we're scared. But I think if there was a guy that you're OK to give up with, it still stinks. But PCI, yeah. I think it could is very fairly that guy. Definitely. I... I always had a little bit of trouble seeing PCA's ceiling. I got high on him after he came through the system, and there were a lot of great reports coming out, and you also liked him very much. But he is, like, as far as the scouting grades for future value go, he's between a 40 and a 50 player. That's really a guy without star potential. Like, he could just be, like, a seven-hitter who plays great defense, and that's super valuable. But I'm not that upset about giving that up. I liked calling him Brandon Nimmo Light because mm -hmm. he's a guy he had a good eye he like he had very good play discipline at a young age which is something that's nice and he was a good athlete he's a better fielder than Nimmo but doesn't have the offensive like talent that Nimmo does right now obviously but that's kind of where I put him was like a poor man's Brandon Nimmo and that he's gonna walk mm -hmm. a lot he'll play center field he's a left-handed bat it's a really super easy comp maybe a little lazy even but yeah. we're, I don't think we're really going crazy losing Pico Armstrong that being said we also thought the Mets were gonna make a few more moves here because we didn't think Javi Baez and Trevor Williams would be the only moves of the deadline. No, definitely. Especially the fact that they took Trevor Williams instead of Zach Davies for the sole reason, reportedly, that he had an option. He's currently with the Syracuse Mets right now. I did, I do believe he actually pitched today on Sunday. And I think he pitched well as well. Oh, of course he did. He's a major league pitcher pitching in AAA. Like, I hope he pitched well. He'll probably be with the team next week. I wish he had Jeff Hardaleeb's roster spot, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. It just, it did seem like the prices were very high this deadline. The Twins got like a crazy amount for Jose Barrios. He is a great pitcher, like top 30 pitcher in all Major League Baseball, but they still held the Blue Jays at ransom. Chris Bryant, a glorified rental, went for a fat package as well. Other guys top my mind right now. I think Rizzo went for a pretty fair price. We supposed to spoke about this though last Thursday. Yeah, Prices that's the people, people who bought early were able to get away with it, which is weird. 
And we even saw like a team like the Rockies who had to move Trevor Story and John Gray not sell because they were asking mm-hmm. for too much. So the prices were crazy on deadline mm-hmm. day. Uh, Barrios got moved for two top 50 prospects. Literally, Austin Martin was taken in the same same draft as PCA, correct? And yeah. Like, what, 15 picks higher? And yeah, he was, he was a top six, I think, pick. Five yeah, or six, I think li- he was. Li- literally a superstar at Vanderbilt. And Simeon Woods Richardson, as Mets fans know, still has a very high ceiling. But going, it is peculiar he's going to be with his third organization, but that's just because he's a coveted prospect. These were crazy prices, especially the weird reports coming out from the Mets and Twins negotiations were very, um, I don't want to say hard to believe for the last couple of days, but just to the point where you don't know who's spreading these rumors. Like the leaks that the Twins asked for Dom Smith or Jeff McNeil in a Barrios or May the package, that they asked for Francisco Alvarez. Like These are unattainable prices. I'm not saying they're true because everyone's leaking nonsense after the deadline to make themselves look better or make someone else look worse. But I don't know. Javi Bai, like, Javi Bai is still a very good player. Yes, he's a very good player. I think... It doesn't move the needle for me. Like if, if right now, if you're watching the video, here's here's my hand with the Mets. I'm feeling good. It goes here. Yeah. I, this is this is World Series. We're going all the way down here for World Series. We're about halfway there. We're like we're better. We're a better team with Javi Baez. And when Lindor mm-hmm. gets healthy, it's gonna be a sick up the middle to have those guys there. But it wasn't the number one need in my eyes, which was a no. starting pitcher. And 100%. after the, and after the Degrom news that we got, yeah. it's even more of a big need. Definitely, especially the fact that they revealed that they were completely aware that Jacob DeGrom would be shut down before the trade deadline happened. Like, you would have figured that they would have gone balls to the wall to get an impact arm or an additional bat. Even though I don't know where you would have fit an additional impact bat or what you would have given up to get them, but Kenta May and Jose Barrios seem to be right there for the taking. Yeah, I know you said with Kenta, and I don't know like what the official word is here, but they were trying to package him with Donaldson as well, right? Yeah, I was going to talk about that with just when the rumors come out like you don't know what was happening apparently they got like to the to the five yard line with Maeda and they just couldn't figure out money which is bittersweet but I don't know I don't know if you want to pay Josh Donaldson 60 million dollars over the next three years just feels like a play. Cano contract that I'm not interested in yeah and I, it would have been cool for Steve Cohen to just use his billions of dollars to assert his will on the rest of the league yes can I fault him for not doing it no it's not my money I wish he would have but I could see the reason, the sentiment, why you wouldn't. I don't know. Last thing here about the trade deadline. Do you think that the Dodgers move of Scherzer and Trey Turner made the Mets a little less aggressive because now that is a super team? I definitely think so. Honestly, yeah, I do. And we talked about this a little bit on the stream. That if that trade wouldn't have happened when it did, I think it would have made the rest of the trade deadline act differently. Because that one came in almost 24 hours before, probably about 19-ish, 18-ish hours before the deadline on Thursday evening. And that has to make every single NL team just, like, shit themselves. Imagine being the Padres. Guys. You thought you had Max Scherzer, and now he's yeah, on the well, Dodgers. The, and then Fernando Tatis gets hurt the next day. At least we can understand we're not the most miserable franchise in National League, National League right now. But I think that most people around baseball will realize the massive return that the Nationals did get for those guys. Like, it doesn't look like anything because you sent two of literally the best players in baseball to Los Angeles. But Keeper Ruiz is a fantastic catcher. He'll be an above-average major leaguer the second the Nationals decide to call him up and start that service clock. And Josiah Gray in two early starts with the Dodgers looked very, very, very impressive. Like, three pitches working. Slider, fastball, curveball. Like, these guys are studs, and the Nationals get six years of control for each of them. So that's just very high-caliber players moving to the deadline. It kind of shocked the whole market, I feel like. Yeah, I feel like the Dodgers kind of just ran in and just kind of fucked shit up a little bit, and people mm-hmm. weren't ready for it. And then the rest was like, how do we pick up the pieces? Bull in a, bull in a china shop. Is that the uh, the saying? Yeah, bull in a china shop, baby. Yeah, it's what it felt like. They just ran in, broke everything. Everyone's picking up the pieces, trying to figure out how where they fit in. And I feel like the Mets were a little bit, you know, prudent in that they didn't go balls to the wall because of the move the Dodgers made. And there's no proof to that, but... No, none. And I think the Mets probably also being aware that Jacob DeGrom might not pitch the rest of the season, what chance do you even have to beat them? Like, how many assets are you going to give up for the rest of this year? There's a good chance we offer Javi Bai as a qualifying offer. There's a good chance we offer him a contract extension, and we could get a very good player at the discount when you factor in his last two seasons. Maybe Hugh Quadlebaum teaches him how to take a walk. It's all possible. He's a versatile player. He's a lot of fun. The floor is low, but the ceiling's high, and he remains in his prime. But it's hard to look at the Dodgers roster right now with the Mets, with Taiwan Walker struggling, Jacob DeGrom 
from remains to be seen. No Noah Syndergaard and Carlos Carrasco working his way back and thinking maybe we can beat them. All those guys are healthy and 100%. We can beat them. We can beat the Super Dodgers team. I'm sure of that. But even having mentioned the fact that Francisco Lindor is still going to be out at least two additional weeks. Another reason why the Mets felt like they had to get a shortstop. And I do think the Dodgers jumping in kind of fucked everything up. Yeah, which is a shame. So Friday, trade deadline, that's what happened. We had game one, though. Back in black, me and James both wearing the uh, free shirt you got for being at the mm-hmm. game. We got there right at the crack of dawn, 5 p.m. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, we were pumped. The stadium yeah. was bumping. The stadium was yep. excited. There was a lot of joy in the air. Carlos Carrasco making his debut. The Mets were printing money in the team store. There was a yeah. lot of good vibes going on. Javi Baez, all this. And with the first pitch of the game, John- Carlos Carrasco gives up a nuke to Jonathan Bomb. India, who is just a Met killer. My God. Yeah. And that kind of just set the tone for the whole night. Yeah, it did. Good call by your boy right here. The Jonathan India was a was a ball player. He has parlayed this solid six games against the Mets into a, a pretty impressive second half already. But yeah, the air came out of that stadium very quickly, and it didn't really feel like it ever got in, back in. We had a chance to put it back in, but we failed miserably at that. Yeah, first inning, we get the bases mm-hmm. loaded. We score Nimmo. Uh, McNeil with a nice double down the line. Mm -hmm. And Nimmo scores from first because Nimmo's a freak athlete and great base runner. Good Mm -hmm. job by them. The top two, like when those guys are hitting one, two, that's a great start to the game, especially with how McNeil's been playing. He's been scalding Mm -hmm. hot. He is so friggin' back. It's unbelievable. It's a great one, two. Pete, nice at bat. We got the bases loaded. And then Michael Conforto steps to the plate. Mm -hmm. And Michael Conforto does one of two things in the tens of thousands of possible outcomes that could happen in a Major League Baseball game that we didn't want him to do. And he Mm. struck out looking. Yep. This guy, I hate to just beat a dead horse here, but my God, he sucks all of a sudden. He's so bad. He's completely lost. Now that bad, he swung at a bad off-speed pitch out of the strike zone. City Field, for the first, like, what, five innings on Friday, there was no track man available, so we had no pitch readings and no miles an hour until basically Carrasco left the game, which means it could have been his decision. So I don't know what happened, but Conforto swung at the pitch that he lunged at early, and then he's probably, I think he took a second strike or hit a foul ball. It wasn't even competitive at bat. There no, he took no a point. fastball right down the middle for strike well, that three. Was, that, that was strike three. Yeah, I'm talking about strike two. But there was no point in that at bat where it felt like Michael Conforto was putting pressure on Sonny Gray. Not even for a moment. And the worst part about it is that Carlos Carrasco settled in beautifully afterwards. If Conforto even could have just hit a fly ball and we could have had the vibes back with a lead after surrendering a home run, I feel like we would have cruised to a victory. But... There was just no chance of that happening. Yeah, Conforto strikeout sucked. A double play would have been great there. Unfortunately, Jonathan VR then hit into a double play. Almost so beat it out. Too. Almost oh. beat it out. If he had two bounces on that ground ball, he hit too hard of a ground ball. That's caused too a double dead. play. Too good of a ground ball. Good for VR. Yeah. But I jinxed the Mets lineup. You've been calling me the jinx for a couple weeks now. And I was like slapping you on the back saying, we're back. Our lineup is back. Can't stop this lineup. We're hitting machines. And that was it. But to be fair... The guys who had gotten to the plate have been hitting recently. Nimmo, yeah. McNeil, Alonzo, and, and Dom, Dom. And Dom. Dom's been a little streaky here and there, whatever. Still not having a great year, but compared to uh, Michael Conforto, he's an all-star. We had four straight hits, and all four guys ripped the cover off the ball. Yeah. And then Conforto just ruined the whole thing. And I want to talk about, before we lament the ending of this game, I want to talk about Carrasco, because this was a very big bright spot for the team, especially coming right on the heels of the DeGrom news, and right on the heels of the trade deadline, not getting an impact pitcher. He does seem like he's going to be an impact pitcher for us going forward. He threw four innings, which was our prediction, two times through the batting order. He had four strikeouts and just the one run on India's solo blast, because that was really a blast. I wanted to undersell that home run. Wind was was blowing in. Yeah, the wind was blowing in from left field, and India just cut right through it like a fighter jet. But one major adjustment that Carlos Carrasco made in this start with the Mets that seems like it's going to be a change from going forward is usage of his sinker or two seam fastball. I don't, I don't know what people called it. I didn't really, I couldn't really glean anything from the pitch physics after the game, like the movement, whatever. But Savant listed as a sinker, so that's what I'm going to call it right now. He has not thrown it more than for about a fifth of his pitches in the last eight years since he came back from missing all of 2012 with an injury. I don't know if that was Tommy John for Rotator Cuff. I can't remember, but I do remember him being hurt and missing a season. Yeah, I don't remember. That was before I cared about Carlos Carrasco, honestly. <laughs> well, being a fancy baseball player, I've cared about Carlos Carrasco for a clean decade, and damn, was I happy with this guy. That sinker had three whiffs on 11 swings, which is 
a lot for a sinker. It doesn't seem like a lot of whiffs, but that's a lot for a sinker, especially only in four innings of work. The Reds put it in play five times. They hit three ground balls, and all five balls in play were outs. It did not allow one hard hit ball. Carrasco himself only allowed three hard hit balls for the next four plus innings after the India leadoff home run. This was as encouraging as a, of a debut as I possibly could have hoped for, given the length of his absence and the uncertainty regarding his health. And I just really wish that this lineup and our bullpen could have picked him up more than they did. Yeah, nobody picked up Carrasco. And you thought that person. that first inning, man, I was I like, holy crap, here we go. Like, the first inning had the feelings of like, that's what a good team does. That's how they yes. respond. Like, that yes. is why this Mets team is going to win the NL East. It felt like a turning point. And they a potential crumbled. Turning point. And they crumbled through the friggin' shoes of Michael Conforto. I'm so, I, I hate to, I had said, it, I hate to be a dead horse, but my God, I'm so so done with him and i never thought i was going to get to this point i thought at some point he was going to figure it out i thought at some point he was going to remember how to be even an okay baseball player Mm -hmm. he shouldn't even be starting in the outfield at this point he's he's killing this lineup he's killing this team definitely not against lefties and i think the mets have made that adjustment i doubt you see michael conforto against a left-handed pitcher moving forward it's wrc plus against lefties this year it's 50 jesus christ that that means michael conforto is 50 percent worse than replacement level right now that's horrible that's not even a triple a player that's no, like it's, sho- it's shockingly bad uh, he's for just... a guy who's so good like what the fuck happened has he crumbled under the pressure of a contract year he had to have i tweeted out today i was like i can't remember and someone replied with cody bellinger so yes but i can't yeah, remember a player play baseball. yeah i can't remember a player as talented as michael conforto just seemingly forget what he's doing like he almost has like the yips of hitters where it's like i don't know how to hit I can't do it. I don't know. I don't know how to swing. His swing at the game today, which is just jumping forward a little bit randomly, yeah. looked horrendous, terrible. Yeah. Is he hurt? Is something wrong? Is he not? Is his is his mental state okay? Like he just looks like. If you told me that Michael Conforto was on the 2015 team and did all those things and had this great year last year, I would laugh in your face and be like, "All right, yeah, <laughs> good good story." He looks terrible. He has no clue. No, he has no approach. The question now I want to ask you is. Let's say he continues this season still kind of meandering where he is. Like, he is okay, like a little bit better, but still not great. Do you even extend him a qualifying offer? Do you want this guy on the team next year for $18 million? I'm done. I'm out. I'm out on Conforto done. completely. I told you at the deadline, let's trade Conforto. Yeah. I feel like I couldn't have been more, like, right in that. If the Mets had an opportunity to move him, they should have. Because I don't know... I hope he proves me wrong. I hope we come back to episode number 37 of the Mets Up podcast. And this is a turning point for Michael Conforto. But <laughs> damn, I am not feeling good about that. When I was at the game today, I just I've not, I haven't been to a Sunday afternoon game in very long. And I forgot. It's just the park is filled with children. Yes. So my section was just full of disgusting, squeamy, like children the whole game. There was this little, there were, but the, some of them were nice, but there was this girl in front of me who had ice cream all over her body. And I was just like seething uncomfortableness for her parents around her. Like they were holding her like arm and leg each and just like wiping ice cream off of her body and off of the chairs as the chocolate dripped down the decorative helmet. But there was one little boy, like a, like a row or two over, cute kid. He was keeping the book definitely incorrectly because I don't think he could write, but he had a book and a pencil. <laughs> and he was wearing like a regular Mets jersey and on the back like it was like a jersey that had the Mets on it blue and orange but the back there was no number embroidered there was no number painted there was no number printed it were pieces of paper colored in that were cut out from construction paper and colored in blue and orange it said Conforto 30 and I know for a fact that this young man wanted a Michael Conforto jersey be it a couple of months ago or a couple of weeks ago and his dad, knowing that he wasn't going to be with the team any longer, was not going to shell out the money to buy a youth small jersey for his kid that was going to grow out of it, for a player that was going to leave the team. And he's like, oh, let's have a fun idea. Let's make our own jerseys. And that's definitely what happened there. That's just kind of how we feel with Conforto right now. He's almost like a dead man walking. Now he feels like a dead man walking. The boos are getting louder and louder. They were very loud today. With every single at-bat. And I, I hate booing guys, typically. I really do. Yeah, but I don't really, boy, I'm oh boy, booing. he deserves it. Yeah, I booed today. I wow. did. I'm so, I literally I'm so fed up because he's not even making an attempt to change anything. And that's what drives me crazy with players. Oh, what, what does that mean? Whatever he's doing hasn't worked all year. And he still stinks. He hasn't made an adjustment. That's what it is. No adjustment's been made to his game. And I think while you can't physically prove it, he has stunk all year. If you stink all year no, from a guy who is year. an all-star caliber player, something is physically wrong there is something fundamentally wrong with the way that you're playing baseball 
Friggin' hit righty. I don't know. He can't play much worse than he is lefty right now. I I can't vouch for that, but I don't. But what's the adjustment? Like Michael Conforto was always succeeded by like taking pitches and working at bats, and like he still is. He's still taking yeah. pitches really well. He still doesn't chase. Uh huh. But he just doesn't hit. Like his baseball savant page is so confusing because he does all the like patience and eye things extremely well and doesn't swing and miss a lot and doesn't chase. But he has he has to take the most called strikes in major league baseball and he's been out for like three weeks i've never seen someone look as a, at as many pitches down the middle as michael conforto something has to be fundamentally wrong with his hands or his load it's almost like he doesn't know how to play baseball i'm so over him i think you saying the um the hitting yips is like pretty on point because this baseball savant page is like kind of handsome and his like X Woba is well above league average, which is a shocking revelation. It's been trending downwards for his last like 24 the plate appearances, as every Mets fan can tell, because he's been way, way, way off. But he's not whiffing, he's not chasing, he's walking a lot, he's hitting the ball hard, he's getting barrels at an above average rate. It's like and like the smart baseball player would tell you, or the smart baseball fan would tell you, like it's gonna come. It's gonna be okay. Oh, I've been beating that drum for months. I'm so fucking tired of waiting. Where is it, dude? Like the fact that in the biggest year of his career he has crumbled so hard tells me this dude doesn't have a ounce of confidence in his body and i think that gary ron keith they've alluded to that for a couple of years now that there's just something about conforto where he doesn't have it like the it i talked about with javi like there's something about michael conforto's game his personality i won't speak to his work that work ethic because i have no idea i'm not in the gym with these guys but he just has never been able to take the step that Mets fans have expected basically since that 2015 run, his like his incredible sensational rookie second half. But I don't know. Maybe this is better off to let this guy go. We yeah. got to get back to this game, though, because we're rambling. Yeah, I'm, I that was my Conforto rant. I needed it. I needed to just spew garbage out of my mouth because I was so frustrated with him. But anyway, back to game one. Let's get to it. Because uh, it wasn't really Michael Conforto's yeah. fault that we lost. No, he could he could have helped. He could have helped. He definitely could have helped. He didn't. The bullpen, okay. I mean, Castro, uh-huh. Drew Flo, it, it was all right. I mean, Castro sharp. gave up that weird hit to uh, Jesse Winker down the line. Yeah, he gave up a run, but like it wasn't like it was more of like a bad luck run than like a this guy got crushed run. A it's, filthy pitch still, too. Yeah, neither of them were sharp though. So. And Drew Flo gave up the home run to Joey Votto, which Mets yeah. fans don't chant overrated at Joey Why? Votto. Why were Mets fans chanting overrated? How Joey Votto's adequately rated. He's possibly underrated. We have guys <laughs> on our team that could get overrated chants. Oh, <laughs> like Joey, lineup. Joey Votto is having an unbelievable year. He's the hottest player in baseball. Overrated is just the wrong terminology to use. And boy, did he make us pay. And then he let everybody know what his name was on the back of his jersey when he touched home plate. Yeah, Joey Vado is a showman. He's a ham bone. He hyped up the crowd, deservedly so. I mean, for an old man, he could still like act pretty impish, which is, is whatever. I give him credit for still having fun. And the Reds have put together a little hot stretch here where they they put themselves back in the thick of it. So it's probably really good mood in that clubhouse, something I wish I could feel. Yeah, it would be cool to have a, a positive feeling here. What was interesting was that Anthony Bonda came in in this game, which off the rip, you're yeah. like, that's a close game, but all right, whatever. Yeah. And he pitched well. Eighth inning. Look, yeah. Looked good in the eighth inning. Did fine. Mm-hmm. But then the Mets punted the ninth, and yes. this is the theme of this series, as we will get to game three eventually. Why? Why, why pitch Anthony Bonda for a second inning in a three-run game, two-run, three-run game, whatever it was? I'm getting the score right now, because I think it was either 4-1 or 3-1. I believe it was 4-1. I'm just going to clarify. But we call this the Casey Stangle episode. You may as well have called this the Jim Trestle episode because Luis Rojas was all about the punt. All right. It was, yes, it was 3-1 entering the night. Yeah, it's even worse. That's like way, way worse. worse. Game. Against the Reds bullpen, which is like bad, bad. You're he talking hem- Philly's. Hembry? Yeah, Philly's bad. Well, it's not Philly's bad because at least they're smart. Like their organization is intelligent and they're getting more out of guys. Like they've turned Heath Hembry into a plus reliever. I'll give credit for that. All the credit in the world, honestly. Yeah. But Anthony Bonda going out for the ninth inning and just getting absolutely shelled completely ruined any chance the Mets had to win. And of course, we rally in the ninth after that. And interesting to note as well, Anthony Bonda pitched against the Reds in that game in Cincinnati. This is the second Mm -hmm. time they've seen Anthony Bonda in like two weeks. And Anthony Bonda doesn't have the greatest stuff in the world. No. Maybe we don't let the lineup see him that much. Also, fast forward to game three, Jeff Hartlieb also pitched in Cincinnati. The next appearance for him was against the Reds in game three in another punt situation. But anyway, punted it. Tons of runs in the ninth. 
The Mets are out of yeah. it. And of course, mm-hmm. the Mets rally in the ninth and score a couple yes. runs. And the ball game would have been completely different. If scored a did. run, not couples. They scored a run. It did yeah, feel but, like more, but because just of how few runs the Mets had scored and how listless and lifeless the offense seemed. But it just sucked that we could have possibly had a situation just to get the tying run to the plate. If you throw Loop uh, or Lugo or May, I wish they would have tried harder for a comeback win. Yeah, it was super weird. And I know it wasn't in great scenario because Carrasco only went four, but you knew that coming in. You got to be smarter. Yeah, that was the plan. It's bad. Uh, it was bad. Like, I like to commend Rojas for good times. Also have yeah. to take shots in for bad times. This is one that definitely is a shot worth at Rojas because I can't in my mind run through any scenario where that made sense. No, none whatsoever. And we're very fair to Luis Rojas. I like to take pride in our fairness to our manager, uh, someone in the running for manager of the year. But we've we've gone very long in game one in the trade deadline. We've got to get to game two here. Yeah, game two. Let's talk about game two. Great game. Cool game. Yeah. Hall of Fame yeah. inductions before the game. We got what? John Matlack. Uh, mm-hmm. Ron Darling, Edgardo Alfonso, and Al Jackson mm-hmm. got in. Mm-hmm. So that was a cool little group. I love Edgardo. Yeah, Edg- I think John Matlick, Edgardo Alfonso, Ron Darling, those are all very underrated players in like Mets lore and baseball lore. Those guys all had a collection of years where they were like near, I want to say like the top of the league. But these guys were all like perennial all-star types who were not able to put it together for the extended stretch that you think of for league greats. These are all good players. I'm happy for them to get their... Um, the recognition they deserve. Yeah, and Edgardo had a little, some of the old 2000 Mets there with him too. Ray Ordonez mm-hmm. got a little teary-eyed when he was talking Spanish to his parents back in Venezuela. It was nice to see. I love Fonzie, yeah. so it's mm-hmm. good, especially when the organization slighted him so badly a couple years ago when he won the oh league God. as the Brooklyn Cyclones yeah. manager, and mm-hmm. the Wilpon said, hey, thanks, you're out, see ya, smell you later. But good to see yeah, Edgardo in the Hall of Fame. Game started off, of course, classic. Jonathan India gets on base because yeah. why wouldn't he? Well, nope, that's what he does. Yeah, awesome he's, he's really, really good. Really quite, quite good. This was a hit-by-pitch, so we're not going to give Jonathan India too much credit for just take, getting plunked, but the guy lives on base all serious. Like, you could not get him out. It was he, impressive. He owns the Mets. He had something to do with that getting hit-by-pitch. He There was some <laughs> skill involved in that somehow. Has to be. But besides that, Rich Hill actually had a pretty nice start again doing what Rich Hill does every single time. Yeah, and on the other side, that Wade Miley was the exact same way, just doing Wade Miley things. Like, it didn't feel like anyone got a hold of a ball until, like, the fourth inning of this game. And which you would think against two soft-tossing lefties, you would, but both of these teams, I don't want to say struggled, because no one struggles against either of these guys, but no. they didn't play great baseball. No, it was, a, it was a frustrating game to watch and be a part of. It was very annoying, especially where the Mets actually do get on the board. Brand Drury gets a hit because that's the only thing the guy knows how to do. Uh, wow, big bird. V- VR drives him in with a sack fly. And instantly, the next inning, Eugenio Suarez, the man who can't hit anything, the man whose bat is slow. This guy, talk about Michael Conforto for getting out of the hit. This is a ridiculous season in the career of Eugenio Suarez. He looked like a prime bounce back candidate after a bad COVID season when he had like a blazing hot three weeks to end the year, take the Reds into the playoffs. He's hitting 170 right now, and he hit a shot off of Rich Hill. Bad pitch calling. They went three high and away fastballs to Eugenio in a row. You can't do that to a guy like Eugenio Suarez. I don't know. I don't care how bad he is or how slow his swing is. Rich Hill throws 83. You can't throw three <laughs> high and away fastballs to a guy like Eugenio Suarez. You just can't do it. No. You're talking about the guy that throws 83. Complete tangent right here, but the wild stat I saw today. Jay Hatt made his St. Louis Cardinals debut today because the Cardinals pulled Jay Hatt in the trade deadline because they're still apparently going for it. Don't know why. Don't know how. Jay Hatt joining the Cardinals rotation became the first member of said rotation, as it currently stands, to have an average fastball velocity of over 90 miles an hour. Oh, my God. Jay Hatt is the hardest throwing Cardinals starting pitcher right now. That's embarrassing. Yeah, so we are lamenting the Mets and how bad that we have looked, seemed, just bad vibes all week. At least Jay Happ is not a hardest throwing starting pitcher. That would be really disappointing. Take that one to the bank. Let's yeah. get back to the game. Yeah, Eugenio Suarez, Nuke, Kyle Farmer hit an also a shot too because Kyle Farmer is like the hottest hitter in baseball along with Joey Votto. And we both, oh. we had to face them both. Yeah. If anyone out there plays fantasy baseball, Kyle Farmer is an exquisite stream this week. They're playing seven games at home and in the Great America Small Park against the Pirates, and I want to say the Cardinals, some other bet team with bad pitching, but pick them up if you're in a deep league and you just need need some help. Again, back to the game. I'm tangent brain right now. Yeah. I want to think about the Mets. Wouldn't, well, don't want to think about them too because <laughs> they were lifeless against Wade Miley. For some Couldn't reason, 
it fits the narrative that we've said all year long. Mets cannot hit soft tossing lefties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we can't hit curveballs because a stat that you shared with me off air was that Sonny Gray just threw his, high, his highest percentage of curveballs all year against the Mets on Friday night. Wade Miley was throwing exclusively junk for the seven innings he pitched. For Wade Miley to be on a mound for seven innings. Like, I don't know. Some, there's someone in the team like needs an amputation. Like There has to be something dramatically wrong with the hitters on the other side. They Except wore, the no-hitter he fucking threw. His ERA is under three this year. I, I don't get it. Yeah, he's he's confusing. He's a guy who just continues to pitch well despite not really having anything that good. And he owns the Mets because, of course. But that being said, Javi Baez making his debut saved the day a little bit here. And it should have been a tie game. But Jonathan VR, boneheaded, gets picked off a second base <laughs> and only makes it a two-run home run. So the Mets are down 4-3. Uh-huh. But Javi Baez, huge home run, need, needed that badly. Yeah, this is the uh, the it factor that Javi brings. This is going to be the whole Javi Baez ex- experience because he will make these crazy, splashy plays that are fantastic. And as we'll see later in the game, he'll do some real bonehead shit sometimes. As a baseball fan, you're just staring at the television asking what the fuck is going on. He has a flair for the, dr- for the dramatics. He yeah. likes to be the center of attention. It's not that he's a selfish player, but he, w- he wants to make something happen every single time he's at the plate. And luckily for us in the sixth, he did with his first home run as a New York Met. Yes, and Rich Hill was out of the game at that point, and my guy Yancy Diaz and Yeri's Familia had very strong innings to keep us in the game, opposite of the Friday night where Drew Smith and Miguel Castro felt like they were, well, not that they felt like, they actually just each gave up runs to push us further out of it, which was a very, very important move for this Mets team to keep some energy and keep some vibes, make them feel like they could win. And then Seth Lugo came in, and for probably the fourth or fifth time in the last couple of weeks, he was ineffective and it started to get me a little scared. He is looking shaky. He just doesn't have the strikeout stuff. It feels like right now, it feels like everyone kind of knows what's coming. I don't know if he's tipping pitches, but he's not fooling anybody. It feels like right now. I love the tipping pitches accusation. Oh, you got it. You always throw it. If if they know what's coming, I'm not going to go as far to say they're banging trash cans. I'm not one of those guys, but (laughs) Pitchers do tip pitches. We saw it with you, Darvish. You, Darvish, literally, I, granted, they were cheating as well, but you, Darvish, <laughs> literally looked human, and it's because he was tipping pitches. Like, he was like, hey, here's my fastball, here's my curveball. It was obvious. But the irony about Lugo's stuff is that his spin rates are, like, not only as good as they've ever been, but better in a way. He's, he's the most spin on any curveball in baseball, and his fastball RPMs are up over 10% this year compared to last. There's just something else, and maybe he is tipping them. Maybe it's command issue. I don't really know what's going on right now with Seth Lugo, but... Actually, I just looked at his baseball savant page, and for some reason, he's exclusively throwing fastballs in the lower part of the zone. That's not that cool. That doesn't feel like a good spot to throw fastballs. No, middle, middle, low yeah. seems very bad. Well, luckily for us, Aaron Loop, Loop, there it is, bailed him out again because Aaron Loop is that friggin' guy. He's yeah. so good. He's like touched by the grace of God right now because he got out of this inning to no merit of his own. He picked off Joey Votto. Nice great pick move. off though, yeah. Yeah, you know, oh yeah. I was going to give him due credit. Great move from the sidewinding lefty. And then Kyle Farmer is just standing in no man's land and allowed Pete Alonso to make, I believe, the first heads up defensive play of his entire career. Like running straight at him across the diamond. Just like, like a little kid. It was funny. People were so excited to move around a little bit. And that was huge and it kind of gave us, you know, the vibes of like, okay. There's a little life. Yeah. Not that we were dead, but hey, here's a little life. Here we go. Things are going our way. The Mets can bring it back. May did pretty good. Started off a little shaky, but... Yeah. The guy loves drama. Walk the leadoff man and get two strikeouts while sweat is dripping from the brim of his hat. Listen, I'm sure if you were hanging around Jerry's Familia as much as Trevor May has this year, you'd probably you know pick up a walk or two from him. Yeah, right. Which led us to the ninth inning. Mm-hmm. We had some craziness in the ninth inning. Of Lot, course. Lots of it. Our boy McNeil getting it started. Nice walk. Gotta love mm-hmm. McNeil. He's playing such good baseball. He's so freaking back. Such good baseball. And Heath Hembry was throwing somewhere to Wade Miley, just junk left and right. He was putting sliders off the plate over and over and over and over again. It took a few for Jeff to foul off before he got the hard earned walk. And that was really big. Lead off, lead off walk. They already know something's good's gonna happen. And it's worth noting that Guillaume came into pinch run for McNeil. We saw mm-hmm. this in game one as we were at the game. McNeil is just not going to be able to bust it. He is not going to be yes. able to do it. He's not going to. Whatever it is that the Mets staff has told him, McNeil will not run a ball out hard the rest of the season because seemingly it looks like he might pop the hamstring again if he does. Yeah, and as a little teaser here, 
Luis Guillerme did come around to score, and he popped his hamstring and is now on the IL. So thank God that we acquired Javi Baez because we wouldn't even have anyone to play enough defense to be a shortstop right now. And speaking of Javi Baez, let's talk about his at bat in the ninth. Yeah, right. Coming up right next. Because Luis Guillerme yeah, got to second on a pass ball. Brutal play by Tyler Stevenson, a guy who you don't like at all behind the plate. Who I like just because he has I have a bat. personal reasons to dislike him. He unfollowed me on Twitter. <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. That's fair. Where's where's Spite podcast? Like I accept Spite. It's okay. It's fine. But Javi Baez, I tweeted this. I said it early in this episode. This is going to be the full Javi Baez experience. He gets a really easy ride to three and zero. I I we should have done some research before the podcast. I would love to know how many three and zero counts Javi Baez has ever experienced in his life. And Heath Hembry, like he does all game, like his new norm Major League Baseball, just throws him a junk slider, low and away, 3-0. Not close. And Javi just flails. Javi tried flails to hit, he tried to hit the game-winning home run. He was like, I can't win the game if I walk. I can only win the game no. if I get a hit. A walk? First base is empty. Guillermo is already on second. I'm not helping anyone if I walk. The joke before this year was that VR was allergic to walking. Javi Baez yeah. might actually get anaphylactic shock if he walks. Gotta get a fucking EpiPen for these guys, I swear to God. <laughs> he had such an awful at-bat. He had such a so good at-bat and so quickly so went bad. bad. And like you said, that is the Javier Baez experience. Mets mm. fans, buckle up. It's not changing yeah. anytime soon. This is what he does. Howie has started to call working in a bat from 0-2 to 3-2 the Nimmo. Working in a bat from 3-0 to 3-2 is the bias. Yes, especially That's when you're really... swinging. If he's like taking yeah. strikes, it's different. You can take things on the corner, waiting for your pitch. When Javi Baez swings at three balls, three more balls, he got thrown six balls in the at-bat and struck out. The 3-1 pitch was hittable. It was a fastball that like kind of missed the black and got a little bit more play than Hembry thought. And Javi put a nice hack on it. Of course, his shoulder like flew out and he tried to pull a home run. If he would just went with it, he would have hit a nice double in the gap. But... This is the Javi Baez experience. This is what they got, and this is what we're going to have to deal with now for the rest of the season. I like in the notes you put, he's legit anti-Giorme. He is. He's everything the opposite of Luis Giorme. If like, he's like the Antichrist to Giorme. You're killing it with the notes here. McCann folded like a cheap chair. Like, <laughs> I, I wrote these right when I got back from the game today, and I was pissed. Well, yeah, I was, was really mad. Hey, there's a lot to talk about in that one. But yeah, McCann, horrible at bat. Awful. So bad. He just <laughs> didn't, not even competitive at all not even close to being competitive he literally folded like a cheap chair there's some times where james mccann comes to the plate and like his like his elbows up and he's like really focused in and there's some times where james mccann comes to the plate and it's as if he's a junior varsity ball player there's no semblance of any kind of approach or understanding or seems like maybe even confidence sometimes he was nowhere close to heath hembry which is a sentence i just said but luckily for us dom clutched the fuck up Great at big bat, time. big hit, adjusted to the garbage that Heath Henry Hembry was throwing, smacked it up the middle, ties the game up. Yeah, he's like three or four foul balls. Even the pitch he hit was low and away. He just barely got barrel on it, just just enough to get it over second base. Which leads us now to the 10th inning. Mm -hmm. Edwin Diaz time. Edwin Diaz had those trumpets. Everyone was feeling good. Everyone's feeling great. Except Edwin, which is kind of the norm now to start the game. He doesn't really like coming out of the gates hot anymore. No, no, no. Wild pitch, what? Like third pitch of the inning? Yeah, which, to be fair, that's a pass ball. Yes. Nito did a, it was a pass shit ball. It was a pass job ball. with that pitch. I was really confused watching this game because as this game was happening, I was like moving from bar to bar and I was getting a little bit drunker and a little bit drunker. When did Nito, was Nito in the game the whole time? Did McCann, because McCann had just hit and then Nito suddenly catching. I believe it was a pinch hit. No, Jason McCann started. They brought Nito in in the 10th inning as just, a defensive replacement. Just to catch... Edwin just, Diaz. just to catch Edwin Diaz on the Puerto Rican connection, because as we've talked about all year, me jokingly and you very seriously, Bro Baseball Classic Edwin suddenly dropped down from the rafters and arrived just ripping an air guitar on the mound, just dominating people left and right. He was so sick with his back up against the wall. He was nuts. <laughs> He was like, wait, wait, give me some pressure. Give me some pressure. First and third, nobody out. Now I'm ready. He's like, it's not a safe situation. It's a tie game. He's like, let me load the bases or <laughs> let me get let me get the guys on. First and second, whatever it was. Or first and third, actually. My bad. First and third. Yeah. Because, yeah, the pass ball the and then an immediate walk. Yes. Which, go. <laughs> <sighs> I'm not just saving. I'm not just getting out of an inning here. I want to make it fun. Yeah, theatrics. Theatrics. WBC. And then the bottom of the tenth, Brandon Jury does what he does best, and yeah. that's mash. Just knock. I, I, mere moments before Brand Jury got the base hit, I was texting you in all caps and texting my dad and tweeting, why isn't Brand Jury bunting? The Mets needed one run. 
and we had a guy in second, nobody out because of the extra inning, inning rule. And Brandon Drew just swung away to get to two strikes. I was like, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> whatever, is doing this right now? Whatever I'm you're just... saying, you're the jinx, man. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I love this power I have, but I have to make sure I use it for good it's, rather than evil. It's pure. You can't force yeah. it. Your, your jinx is no, so pure. Yeah, yeah they're, they're really natural jinxes. <laughs> but fun game. That felt really good. After a really okay. disappointing game one, that game two one was like, okay, there they are. They're the boys. Could you imagine where we'd be if that didn't happen? Oh, I would. I don't know if I'm recording an episode tonight. I might just <laughs> fall asleep, not answer texts. I might be like, James, the black jerseys, man, it's the, it's the end, it's death, <laughs> despite being in first place. Uh, but literally, that was happening today at the game. People, I guess this is going to be a nice transition to game three, because this felt like it may have been the worst game of the year. City Field had this weird blend of being really hot, but also kind of cold. The weather was weird. The sun was weird. I don't know, Vladimir Gutierrez, I just hate him more than anything in the world now. And people were kind of getting ornery restless. in the stands. Restless. Yes, restless. Upsetting. Max fucking Schrock. Go Cox. Had Game Cox. Really? Five hits? Are you kidding me? Yeah. Is he is he going to get five hits the rest of his major league career? <laughs> of course, he's a game cock. <laughs> he's talented. Today sucked. Today was terrible. Sucked. Me and James both at the game. Uh, that bucket hat, man. Got to burn that thing. I know, yeah, just for the listeners at home. the If anyone's taken the 7 line or the LIRR to the Mets games this year, you've seen the guys selling the bucket hats on the platform, the stairs, walking down from the train station to the um, center field entrance to City Field. And I've been eyeing those bucket hats all year. I love bucket hats, especially keep the sun out, kind of fashionable. They let they let people know you're there to have a good time, you know? No one is ever upset in a bucket hat, besides me, today and on Friday night. So I bought a bucket hat. I haggled, of course, because you got to haggle with those guys. You get $5 off, you really just, the whole day feels better. And that bucket hat is now 0-2, and the Mets have scored a total of three runs when I've been wearing it at games. I'm giving it one more shot. Ugh, I'm gonna pick. A- <laughs> that's bold. That's bold. I don't know about that one. I'll allow it. I'll allow it. But anyway, that's not why the Mets lost. The Mets lost because they couldn't hit Vladimir Gutierrez. Yeah, he was no hitting of- us through five innings. Yes, they were swinging out of their shoes against the guy who they had annihilated less than ten days ago. Now, granted, the Mets hit a lot of great American ballpark home runs today. Yes, they loved literally. two in the first inning. Yeah, loved a good warning track shot against Vladimir Gutierrez, and there were some hard hit balls. But the fact of the matter is. Honestly, going an inning hitless against Vladimir Gutierrez is disrespectful to everyone who's ever played the game of baseball. That guy's so not good, yet the Mets couldn't figure him out after owning him in his first start. He didn't change anything. He wasn't any different. No, and you could definitely feel um, Rojas's frustration after the game. He was like, I don't know where our approach was. We got to this guy very recently. It just felt like no one was really up there with a plan. I was like, oh, shit. Which was kind of scathing. So, he's so right. He couldn't have hit the nail uh, on the head more. There was mm-hmm. no plan in this game. Again, outside of the guys who were playing well, which is McNeil, Alonzo, Dom mm-hmm. Smith even. Everybody kind of, yeah. everybody else felt like they had no clue what was happening today. Dude, I think that the Mets are undergoing some kind of a phenomenon with Kevin Pillar. If we could have like a bar graph showing who appreciates Kevin Pillar and we like rank it by age demographics, it's like 0 to 19, 19 through 25, 25 through 33, and 35 and up. The old guys love Kevin Pillar so much. It's when Kevin Pillar got that seeing eye single to end the no-hit bid, my dad's like, I need more guys like that in the lineup. I was like, if you watch the guy hit for the past two months, he's been struggling. He he can hit the broad side of a barn. He is uh, he's a clutch player. He, he gets the big hit you know, when you need it. He gets some nice at-bats every once in a while, but by no means do the Mets need more of him because that would be more guys who have an OPS of like 620. Yeah, I do respect the shit that Kevin Pillar. He put his body on the line today for that um, double in the gap. Yeah. I think that might have been one of the, the Chirac shots, I'll call them. Looked like the face was going in to the ground. I was really shitting my pants for a second. I was there at the game with my family. My mom's like, is he okay to do that? I was like, I honestly don't even know. <laughs> That's such a mom comment of like, oh my God, I hope he's okay. <laughs> it's like, well, I hope he gets the ball. <laughs> oh, this offense, man. It is just like, it's causing me to drink tonight. I'm having a little adult beverage because I'm like, I want to forget this game. It was so bad. It was so miserable. And Stroman didn't even pitch bad. Like he, he was more than capable today. Yeah, this was a good enough performance to win on a different day. He just got Max rocked. Like, I don't know what else to say about this. He ran with the sinker, sp- slider, splitter combination that he's been very successful with this season. Still mostly sinkers, but it was like in the 40% range rather than the 50s and 60s. He's worked with in some of the starts where he struggled more so. The slider especially was just completely filthy. 
He had six whiffs on 13 swings with it, five called strikes. His CSW rate was over 40%. Like, he was good. It was it sucked he couldn't get out of that sixth inning, especially because Miguel Castro came in and promptly walked the eight and nine hitters to bring in a run. But the offense just needs to pick him up. Coming back to City Field has taken all of the juice out of this offense. Everything that we had gained between the, that last game in Pittsburgh, heading to Cincinnati, and what well, even was that other series but that we played on the road? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, no, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and then we came home? Yeah. No, there, there was a weekday series, wasn't there? Before with the five-game Braves? No. Who'd the Mets play last weekend? The Blue Jays at home. That's what it was. And the offense went cold there. Yeah. Against, like, subpar pitching. So it seems like the Mets just can't hit into the field, which is a fucking conversation we should be having in 2011. No. Like, ugh, it's uh, the, the offense is just stinking. And Conforto, again, had another terrible day. I don't know why. Why is J.D. Davis not playing? I know Drury's the hot bat right now, but where's J.D. Davis? They he never play JD. They never play JD with Stroman on the mound just because there's going to be ground balls. He didn't play he at had. all this series, though. He didn't start a single game. That is true. I don't know. Maybe he should have played the Rich Hill game. I don't know. Yeah. They're never going to play him with Stroman. They're like, the guy has just a, a, lead, a lead brick attached to his left hand. He can't field anything. Yeah. But, I mean, we need a bat right now. At some point, we got to give up a little defense, I think, to score some runs. We just got the bat. We have Javier Baez, man. I don't fucking know what to say. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're losing our minds right now. I am like just so down after this performance this weekend. Castro walking Vladimir Gutierrez with the bases loaded is on four pitches. Despicable. There was a, Jeremy Hefner took a mid at bat mound visit. 2 0. He was like, yes. give me a sec. And it on. didn't even look like he talked to Rojas. Like, I'm going out there. I'm going to rip a head off. And it was quick. It was prompt. <laughs> did not work. No, no, no. It didn't work even a little bit. This. That was such a demoralizing moment. The game was completely over at that point. And even though it wasn't actually over, because the Mets were only down 4-1, I believe it was, heading into the ninth inning, we called on Jeff Hardalib to take us to the bottom of the ninth. I have not felt the air leave a stadium quicker than that. A little, little, little punt action there. There you go, yeah. By the New York Mets. Viewers, yeah, you, you can watch Mark stand up and have poor punting for him. Jim Tress will be ashamed of you, son. Well, good. I'm glad, because I'm sick and tired <laughs> of fucking punting. Can this team enough? I, I get it. I, no, I don't get it, actually. I lied. I no. don't get it. I don't understand why we did it. The Reds bullpen stinks. Why are we punting against them in a three-run game? I don't know why Jeff Hardalib is on this roster when we just acquired Trevor Williams. Like the, Maybe we want to keep Trevor Williams stretched out because we need him to start, but what are you saying? The, there? Pirate, you the Pirates didn't want Jeff Hartlieb. The Pirates <laughs> said, I don't want you. Get off my team. And the Mets were like, oh, you. Yes. Pitch. Aaron Loop only threw four pitches on Saturday and didn't pitch on Friday. He 100% could have thrown one of the ninth innings either today, Sunday, or Friday night to keep us in these games. It was really, again, we give Rojas credit when he does things well. I was very, very perturbed by the way he used this bullpen in both losses. I was at a game with the Reds fan today. Shout out to Will. He was like, who is this guy? Why are they throwing him? Who, why are they pitching this guy? And when, they, when he gave up the runs because he stinks... He was like, I can't believe they punted in a three-run game against our bullpen. Right? After we took advantage of their bullpen the day before to win a game. Like, was anybody watching? Is anybody paying attention to this shit? I know. And we scored in the ninth in game one, too. And the cherry on top of everything was fucking Justin Wilson, fresh off his DFA from the New York Yankees, coming in to close it out against us. A woman behind me in my section was like, is that the same Justin Wilson? I was (laughs) like, you fucking bet it is. And boy, is he having a rough year, but he got three outs today. Yeah, he got three outs. Got three outs who needed. This was, that, that was the nail in the coffin in the Mets offseason. Didn't resign Justin Wilson. Little yeah. did we know. That he would come back to haunt us in the Cincinnati Reds uniform. Shit series. Yeah. Shit fucking series. Pardon my French, Shit. but it is just, it is down in the dumps time for me. No, this is the most negative episode we've had, I think, by far. Maybe those Red Sox episodes in April, but I can't even count those. I f- feel like I've grown 25 years since then to doing at least 30 episodes since we, the fucking Red Sox came to City Field in April and we couldn't hit. The, but, the thing that was disappointing about this series is the Mets got beat, yes, but they played bad, bad, bad baseball. There was nothing redeeming about this series almost, except Carlos I mean, Carrasco's debut and McNeil being hot. Yeah. Uh, I think you're being a little too dreary about that. I think that the Mets didn't hit super well this series, but there were a couple good baseball things to play. Javi Baez made an incredible throw and relay today yes. to nail, um, I don't know, was that Farmer? The Suarez, play? no, remember. Eugenio Suarez, Suarez who is right, 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 one of the yeah. slowest human beings on the planet. <laughs> he has such a cannon. It's crazy to watch it live. It was 91 miles an hour, that throw. That's sick. It's a howitzer. And we pitched well. All of our real relievers pitched pretty fine, including Anthony Bando the first inning. I also, Anthony... 
Goodbye to Anthony Banda. Thank you for the work you've done. DFA. Hope we see him again sometime. I think we will. Ah, someone might pick him up. I don't know. But it's just the bats, man. Like, the defense wasn't bad. The baseball wasn't bad. Fundies. We were clutch. It was just the fucking bats. Couldn't come through. Especially in a weekend where the vibes were so high. Fans were in the building. Black jerseys. We've been talking about this shit for fucking months. I feel like such an idiot for being excited about jerseys. Ugh. Those Sucks. jerseys look so friggin' good, too. Yeah, they were sexy. Michael Conforto looked great in it, and boy, did he do him a disservice. I, I have tickets to the next black jersey game on uh, August 13th against the uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers. That should be fun. Jeez. Uh, little fun, little tidbit of info here about the black jerseys. People wondering why the Mets waited so long to unveil them during the season. Major League Baseball is a really dumb rule where if you want to put a jersey in your rotation, you know, talking about home, road, away, alternates, all that kind of stuff, it has to be sent to the league two years in advance for approval. So we will not see these jerseys in rotation probably until 2024, 2023, Sucks. whatever it is, which is nonsense. First off, Major League Baseball, who loves to cry poor, Basically just said, we don't want to make more revenue because we don't want to have these jerseys be in rotation. There should be a guy who like part of his job, because it really shouldn't take up more than five minutes, is like, you approve baseball jerseys. Oh, the Mets? This isn't a frat kid making a jersey? Yeah, this is a pro look. Approved. I can't believe there's a two-year process. What is that? And just building off that, the fact that the Mets waited so long to debut them because they have five home games the rest of the season, including last Friday, four left. So they wanted to wear them for all of the Friday home games moving forward. Yes, because you can only, they're classified as limited use jerseys right now, and you can only wear those five times in a season. So add that to the list of dumb fucking rules Major League Baseball has. But uh, The laundry list. Yeah, and no fun league. We have to do a hard transition right now because the... Hard times did not end with this game on Sunday because about one full hour after it ended was the deadline to sign first round picks from 2021 Major League Baseball draft. And the Mets were the only team not to strike a deal with their first round selection, Kamar Rocker. Kamar Rocker wanted, is no longer a New York Met. No, I want to get your f gut feelings on that. I'm okay. I kind of am too. I'm okay. And I don't like that I'm okay. I want to be upset. I want to be mad. But I, uh, it, this is so weird. And maybe I'm a little bit of a Cohen, you know, puppet shill. here. Shill. Yeah, maybe I'm shilling a little bit. So this will yeah. be the first time I'll allow someone to call me a shill here. But this is the right move as a baseball organization. The fact that Kamar Rocker was so hesitant to get an MRI during the draft, it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to, but he was the only guy of like the top 50 or 100 prospects that refused it. Tells you something's up. No, this, this entire process was very suspect, and you can't, again, I don't want to be considered someone who takes like the corner of a billionaire and defends someone for not spending money, but I don't think money had anything at all to do with this Kamar Rocker situation. There were initial reports, and we did say it on the last episode, that the Mets and Rocker and Boris were haggling. I can't discount the influence of Scott Boris here. But the initial reports, they were haggling over a couple of million dollars. They wanted to lessen the bonus. But little inklings of reports have come out later today that the Mets were just completely done with Kamar Rocker the second they saw the medicals. It wasn't about $6 million, $3 million, $4 million, $2 million, $1 million. It was a yes or a no question, and they just said no. And if that is the case, if Kamar Rocker's... UCL is just brisket right now and it's about to fall off the bone. How can you really validate taking this guy rather than just getting an extra pick next year? Especially when you understand this has happened twice in the last seven years with Brady Aiken, number one overall pick from the Astros in 2014, and Carter Stewart from the Braves. But that was an injury concern. That was like um money. That was like that strictly like, money. Yeah, yeah. That, but it wasn't like going to play in Korea or something. There was something weird going well, on. Well, with Carter Stewart, the thing was with the Braves is that the Braves wanted to pay him less than slot value. He wanted to make his money. They said, we're not going to pay you. And he said, okay, I'll go play in Japan and I'll go make the money that I deserve in Japan. And it's worked out pretty well for him. But also, do you really want to be a 21, 19, 18 year old kid playing in Japan when you could be in the minors working to become a major league pitcher? It's interesting to see. We've never seen anything like that with Carter Stewart. Mm -hmm. Brady Aiken's the most comparable. Brady Aiken was yes. not drafted or not signed in 2014. Mm -hmm. signing bonus thing but same thing ucl issue and what do you know the next year that he came out and pitched blew his ucl tommy john surgery he was then drafted i think a couple years later by the indians in the first round and brady aiken has done nothing since 
Brady Aiken very clearly was never the same again. We kind of take for granted how easy it is for most pitchers to rehabilitate after Tommy John surgery, but that's a grueling, grueling, grueling process. Just the idea of the surgery itself is shocking to those who don't know what happened. I explained to my sister today for the first time she didn't know, and her jaw dropped. You are taking a ligament from someone's knee and putting it into your elbow. What the fuck is that? That's that's like that's like that's like fu- that's futuristic shit. That's some alien shit right there. Yeah, and. I think that the new the um, I don't want to say this, and I think it's I think let me jump in here too. I think it's also important go. knowing we don't know exactly what is wrong. It could be UCL, no. it could be shoulder, it could be something mm-hmm. in his form, it could be this or that. But whatever it was, it was enough to scare the Mets away. So it usually leads to either UCL or TOS, the thoracic outlet. Definitely, and Scott Boris has doubled down, saying that Kamar Rocker doesn't have any injury at all. Which I which, feel like is bullshit after the news that Kamar Rocker is foregoing his senior year at Vandy. He is not going yes. to pitch. He is going to spend the entire year working out and getting stronger. What does that sound like to me? Rehabbing. It's just bullshit that this story has gone where it's gone in the media and on Mets Twitter. And I feel like all of it is the work of Scott Boris and his media puppets. Ken Rosenthal, a known Boris shill, has written multiple articles over the last week saying how badly the Mets had to get this done. And all the SJWs on Twitter are talking about Steve Cohen's art collection, that he couldn't pay a college kid a few million dollars. Which is insane. Someone life-changing yeah. money. It's, this, is, this isn't what it's about. We're building a fucking baseball team here. We're putting an organization together. It's not it. a like, charity. No, it's also like, I, if Kamar... If this was a money issue, I'm sure they could have found common ground, but it very clearly seems like it wasn't. Snake Andy Martino has said it wasn't a money issue. I don't know what's up his sleeve. I don't know who he's working for. I don't know if I can trust him, but it's something that's been said. More information is going to come out about this. We just don't know all the facts yet. I don't know if we ever will. I think we might. Based on the fact that Steve Cohen ran his mouth this evening, I think that we will know more things. If anyone hasn't seen this, Steve Cohen tweeted that basically all draft picks are just pieces, like investments, pieces of meat that MLB owners are using for a great ROI. And that since draft picks are such a good ROI generally, if this was actually a good investment, that he would have gone through with it, which I think he did in a way that he wanted to make it seem like the Mets made a prudent decision. But people on Twitter, and rightfully so, have taken it as this guy doesn't really seem to care about the human element of the game. And I don't think that's a surprising um, consequence. Hot take. You shouldn't mm-hmm. care about the human element of the game. It's about winning and losing. I don't disagree with you. I think and Billy Beans, uh, played by Brad Pitt, said this very eloquently in Moneyball that you can't know these guys. You can't build relationships. You have to trade them, cut them, send them up, send them down. Like You can't have anything around. These guys are just functions of a team a team that we hope is going to win a world series in the near future so you can't get caught up in the emotional shit life-changing money i get that but it's got boris was trying to pull the wool over on the mets and they were trying to bait they were suspect pre-draft they had been really sketchy post-draft all of these billboards popped up all over manhattan there's no saying that that wasn't scott boris putting those up to try and continue get this momentum because he was fully aware that he was going to have to try strong arm and pressure the mets into giving a contract to a guy who's again elbows fucking brisket right now most likely i understand the average mets fans concern because i think the average met fan and i'm not talking about even the people listening to this because i think the people listening to this are more than average mets fans i think you're a pretty well educated mets fan but Thank I under- you, everyone listening. We love the listeners. But I understand, you know, my uncle, who maybe just watches the games once or twice a week, and hearing that the Mets aren't going to sign Kamar Rocker, $6 million, they're not going to give it to him. I can understand that person being a little bit upset, being a little nearsighted. But the more you dive deep, er, deeper and deeper into this story and the Kamar Rocker stuff and the MRIs and all this medical stuff, I think, like you said at the beginning of this, it was not about the money. It was about the medicals. And medicals can be scary. You can't give a guy just it's like setting a precedent. You want to run a good organization. You even said this to me before. Mm-hmm. Steve Cohen didn't make $14 billion by giving away six to rent to anybody. No, it's not about the human element. It's not about the six million dollars and the Mets were too cheap. It's not about that. The Mets were going between two million dollars. Basically, we want to give you four. Here's six. The Mets decided that from an organizational standpoint, it would be smarter to avoid Kamar Rocker and not sign him. Get the draft pick next year, along with whatever first round pick I think they're going to have as well. I think they'll have two now Mm -hmm. because of that. Yes, they will have two. Plus, any compensatory picks they will get from players with qualifying offers signing elsewhere. Realistically, this came down to a decision on whether they thought Kamar Rocker's ceiling with this impending medical procedure was higher or the potential 11th pick in next year's draft. 
cost included because it is going to screw up the Mets slot um, possibilities next year having two first round picks. I don't actually know if they're going to get more slot money because they reward an extra pick. I I don't know how often this happens. The draft guy, maybe we could look this up. I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe I heard that you do not get more slot money. Okay. But well, I think that's entirely possible because that would um push more owners and organizations to sign the draft picks that they make because this that's what's supposed to happen the baseball draft system is broken but you are supposed to sign the picks that you make but if something was concealed and hidden like i i i don't know it just i can't really fault the mets for this process to me it's super sketchy when a guy on a voluntary thing mri that everybody takes before the draft it's basically you know write a passage for the draft says i'm good and then when we hear that there could that there's medical stuff going on, that's sketchy. There's something that I don't like there. Something's fishy. Yeah. And when their agent is Scott Boris and he doubles down the fact that there are no medical concerns, we will not be playing college baseball this season, actually. Yeah, we're not going to pitch, but there's no problems. This whole thing just stinks to high heaven. You, f- and you feel like if he wanted to prove that there was nothing wrong, he'd pitch. Yes, and I just, I'm not going to be able to deal with the people on Mets Twitter acting like the world is ending because of this. Especially, I think this whole situation has even just snowballed because, one, we're the Mets, and as everyone, ESPN especially, knows, we generate clicks. The Mets bring the fucking heat. Jeff Passon put out like five tweets today. He's a fucking lunatic. He's a loser. Fuck that guy. The Mets, I I do like Passon generally, but the way he covers the Mets is so fucking so enraging it makes me so angry espn in general but again the mets bring the fire everyone knows the mets get clicks people who like them because we have such a rabid and large fan base and people who hate them because lol mets is a thing the mets had a bad weekend they kind of got dunked on with the black jerseys and made the whole thing look like a fucking gimmick we look really dumb egg on our face on top of that kumar rocker was arguably the most famous player in this draft and he was represented by the greatest agent ever known to mankind this was a perfect storm of chaos that has turned into this ridiculous media frenzy right now if this was i don't know if this if this was ty madden with the tigers no one no one bat a fucking eye Dude. it would just be something that happened oh he's a bad medical good for the tigers prudent an organizational move take the first round pick next year and let him go back in the draft see what happens i'm gonna give a shout out to my friend wheels here who's a very casual baseball fan he's gotten into it more good friend of mine Angels fan. He said, if the Mets would have taken Sam Bachman and the same thing happened, he goes, no one cares. And I was like, Wheels, no, no one at all. that right there is why the Mets did the right thing. Because it shouldn't be about the name. It shouldn't be about the notoriety. It should be about the actual factual information that we have. And from what the Mets seem to have, the smart decision in their eyes was to not sign Kamar Rocker. So I stand by them with it. I'm okay with it. I wish it wasn't the case. I wish we yeah. had him. But I feel like if no. the Mets front office, with the experience that we have and the knowledge came to the decision that it was smarter to go without Kamar Rocker than with, who am I to say that they're wrong? Definitely. Like, I couldn't agree with what you're saying more. I think this all plays into my weird tinfoil hat conspiracy theory that Scott Boris has been pushing the media and just the general population into this point for the last couple of weeks. This was an absolute concerted effort by, I'll say it again, the greatest agent in the history of mankind. No one is as good at what he does as Scott Boris. Scott Boris has his own marketing company within his agency. Scott Boris has his own trainers within his agency. He allows his clients to get every single thing they need from him because he is so fucking good at it. These billboards popped up like two days after he was drafted. It's a, it's a fucking MLB draft. There were no Marcelo Meyer billboards in Boston, and he is far better player than Kumar Rocker. Jack Leiter? Jack Leiter this was there was this shit stunk from the beginning it didn't even make sense that he made it to the Mets it was too good to be true the Rockies thing where they couldn't draft him yeah like there was too many fucking weird factors at play and it's gonna take a few years for us to really see how this goes and everything aside is going to be fascinating to watch Kamar Rocker's trajectory from here on out I think we probably should have known something was up when the Rockies were interested yeah. That should have been our red flag. When the most incompetent organization in Major League Baseball wanted Kamar Rocker, we should have known that something was wrong. 100%. I agree with that take. That's my hindsight's 2020 here. Rockies were interested in Kamar. We should have been out. But anyway, that's enough about Kamar Rocker. You can only talk about it for so much because there really isn't much else besides what we just said. If you're a Mets fan, have your take, whatever it is. But to kill the Mets organization over this would be foolish. There's a lot more things to get mad about. Be mad about the trade deadline. Don't be mad about Kamar Rocker. Definitely, but if you guys want to get your clicks, your likes, your retweets, like, by all means, get after it. And I've had enough of this. Let's talk about Marlins preview. Yeah, the the antidote for a struggling Mets team is a four-game series in Miami. On the other hand, this series could literally break my heart, my dreams, my soul, and the hopes of this team the rest of the way. This series has huge 
huge trap feels. Huge. Trap. Because the Mets play the Phillies in Philly, Philly the weekend after the Marlins series. Mm-hmm. This is a trap, and I hope the Mets don't fall into it because the way they're playing, they're not beating the Marlins. I mean, the way they're playing, they could definitely beat the Offensively, Marlins. Offensively, they're also, not. <laughs> it also sucks that we're going down to Miami right after the Yankees are leaving there with a sweep that has revived their season to pull them to basically having the same win percentage as the Mets, which is just such a fucking knife in my back. My God. And also, on top of everything else, the Mets are going to face Jesus Lazardo tomorrow, Monday oh, night, sick. tonight, when you guys are listening to this. Yeah. The triumphant return of the once golden boy traded from the organization that drafted him, signed him. I don't know if he was international. The organization that nurtured him for a rental. And this is his first shot with the new team, a team that clearly sought him out with a plan in mind. Yeah, he's going to probably pitch great. We got McGill going in game one. That's what Mets.com mm-hmm. is telling me. Game two, we got Taiwan against TBD. I'm guessing there's going to be a it's lot of TBDs. Be, no, to, that, that game is going to either be Jordan Holloway or Braxton Garrett. I have seen them different reports for either of them. Braxton Garrett was sent down to the minor leagues on July 25th. So unless someone goes on the IL, which they could put anyone in the IL whenever they want, they can't call Braxton Garrett up tomorrow. It could happen. It could not. Or on Tuesday, I mean. But if not, we'll get Jordan Holloway, who just bona fide sucks. Yeah. He's a step be- He's a step below Vladimir Gutierrez. If we don't hit Jordan Holloway, if we lose to Jesus Lazaro, though, and then lose to Jordan Holloway, I'm going to be in a ditch. Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> I'm going to go right to the East River. I'm going to nosedive. <laughs> Carrasco versus Thompson on the Wednesday. Yeah, and Zach Thompson's a nice little pitcher. He probably dice us up. I'm starting him in fancy this week. Nice. And then Thursday, <laughs> Mess.com is refusing to load. I guess we might not even have a clue. Maybe nope. Rich Hill? Yeah, the Thursday afternoon game is going to be a little Miami matinee Thursday at 12-10. is going to be Rich Hill versus Trevor Rogers, which is the number one game that I don't want to watch. No, of course not. Uh, that is going to be boring, and we're probably going to lose that one. It doesn't feel like a great matchup. Trap, trap, trap. Please, it's God, trap. don't fall into the trap, because the, we're, we're definitely looking to head to the Phillies. I think it's hard not to, but you can't. Mm-hmm. You, got, you got to just beat up on the Marlins. They're not good. I don't even want to give a serious prediction because we've been giving those a lot recently and it's just a little bit dangerous. Let's win on Monday night. Let's score three runs off Jesus Cesar, though. Small goals. Yes. Small goals, meet them. You feel more accomplishment. Yeah, exactly. One game at a time, one step at a time, one inning, one at bat at a time. Let's focus on the little things. Let's get it done right because we didn't focus on the little things and get them done right in this game or in this series against the Reds. No, not the dish at least. Yeah, not the dish. So I think that's where it's going to wrap up our most somber and disappointing and sad and angry and frustrated episode of the Mets up podcast here and longest number 37 Casey Stengel I think we would have done him proud with our upset and our fervor and everything that was coming out of our mouths he would have loved a little bit of fire that we had for these New York Mets hopefully you guys aren't feeling as bad as us I'm hoping you're feeling good I'm hoping that you guys are a little more positive than us because as I just said it's not great here but (laughs) We will see how we feel after this Marlin series. That's what's great about this yeah. podcast. You can find us at the end of the Marlin series for episode number 38, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, on the YouTube channel at Metzed Up. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram, Metzed Up Podcast. Nope, it's just at Metzed Up. I lied. <laughs> at Metzed Up. Before we go, I don't want to say anything official, but there's a chance that we have our first ever guest on the podcast next week. Oh, yeah. This has... This has the potential to be big. I don't want to reveal it yet because I'm still in communication with who I'm in communication with. I'm going to talk to him on the phone tomorrow to hopefully hammer things out. It's at an 80 right now. I want to make it 100 before we say any names or anything. But I'm going to tease it. So Mets up listeners, please get excited because we might really be dropping something big on Thursday. Yeah. Or Friday would be. And here's a little hint for you Mets up listeners at home. Uh, lost in translation. Do what you want with it. Ooh. Take it for what it is. But that is our hint for who could be our first guest on the Mets up podcast. And it would be a sick one. And I'll give Mets, Mets up listeners a second hint. A long walk on the beach. Oh, ooh, that's good. That's yeah. good. So if you guys figure it out, tweet us uh-huh. at Metzed Up, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube channel, Metzed Up Podcast. I already told you where to listen to us. You guys know the drill from here on out. We're going to wrap up this long ass episode of the Metzed Up Podcast here. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time. Peace out. See you later, guys.